Hi everyone, this lecture will be about reproducible research and I want to just talk about some concepts and ideas that, um, are, that are related to reproducible research and, and just in case you haven't heard about it or uh, don't know what it is. So the basic idea is that in science, replication is the most important element uh, of kind of verifying and validating findings. Uh, that scientists discover. So if you claim that X causes Y or that vitamin C improves disease or that this causes a problem, uh, what happens is that you know other scientists and that are independent of the original will, will try to investigate that same question and see if they come up with the same result. And if lots of different people come up with the same result uh, and replicate the original finding, then we can tend to think that, well, then the original was probably true and that this is a real relationship or real finding. So. The ultimate standard in strengthening scientific evidence is replication, and, we, and the goal is to have independent people do independent things with different data, different methods, and different laboratories, and see if you get the same result. Because if, if a finding is robust to all these different things, then it's more likely to be true, and the evidence is stronger in its favor. Um, replication is particularly important in studies that have kind of have big policy impacts or can influence regulatory types of decisions. So. What's wrong with replication? So there's really nothing wrong with it. This is what science has been doing for a long time, through uh, hundreds of years, uh, and there's nothing wrong with it today. Uh, but the problem is that it's very, it's becoming more and more challenging to do replication or to replicate other studies. And because, and part of the reason is because studies are getting bigger and bigger. Uh, in order to do big studies, you need a lot of money. And so there's a lot of money involved. And if you want to do 10 versions of the same study, you need 10 times as much money. And there's not as much money around as there used to be. Um, sometimes it's just it's difficult to replicate a study because you know if the original study took 20 years to do, it's difficult to wait around another 20 years for replication. So that can be a, a challenge. Um, some studies are just plain unique. So if you're looking at a unique situation in time or a unique population, uh, you can't readily replicate that situation. So there are a lot of good reasons why you can't replicate a study. And so um, <clears throat> the idea is that, well, if you can't replicate it, uh, is the alternative just to do nothing, just let that study stand by itself. Uh, and so the idea behind reproducible research is to create a kind of minimum standard or a middle ground where we won't be replicating the study, but maybe we can do something in between. So the basic problem is, you know, you have the gold standard, which is, which is replication, uh, and then you have the kind of the, the the worst standard, which is nothing. And so, what can we do that's in between the gold standard and nothing? And that's what we're thinking is reproducibility. So uh, that's how we can kind of bridge the gap between replication and nothing. So why do we need this kind of middle ground, uh, which I haven't clearly defined yet? But the basic idea is that. Um, you know, you make the data available for the original study, uh, and you make the computational methods available, uh, so that other people can um, can can look at your data, can run the kind of analysis that you've run, uh, and and to kind of com come to the same findings that you found. And so, a lot of this, what reproducible research is about, is a validation of the data analysis. Uh, because you're not collecting independent data uh, using independent methods, you can, it's a little bit more difficult to validate the, the the question itself that you're asking. But if you can take someone's data and repli and reproduce their findings, then you can in some sense validate the data analysis. Uh, and so this involves uh, having the data and the code because you know most more likely than not the analysis will have been done on a computer using some sort of programming language like R. And so if you can take their code and their data and reproduce the findings that they come up with, then you can at least have confidence that the analysis was done appropriately uh, and, uh, and that the, the correct methods were done, were used, excuse me. So um, what is driving this need for kind of a middle ground, this reproducibility middle ground between replication and doing nothing? Well, there's a lot of new technologies on the scene in, in many different fields, including biology and chemistry and environmental science, all kinds of areas. These technology allows us, allow us to collect data at a much higher throughput. And so we get these very complex and very high dimensional data sets almost instantaneously compared to even just 10 years ago. And so the technology has allowed us to create huge data sets. Uh, at, a, at essentially the touch of a button. Uh, furthermore, we have computing power that allows us to take kind of existing databases and merge them into just even bigger and bigger databases. So we can take data that were previously maybe inaccessible and create new data sets out of them. Uh, so these new data sets are huge now. Um, and in addition to allowing us to create new data sets, 
uh, computing power allows us to, to, um, to do more sophisticated analyses. So the analyses themselves, the models that we fit, uh, and the algorithms that we run are much, much more complicated than they used to be. And so having a basic understanding of these algorithms is difficult, uh, even for a sophisticated person. So understanding what someone did in an analysis of data will require um, looking at code, looking at the computer programs that people used. Um, and, so the, and so the bottom line with well, all these different trends is that for every field X, there is now computational X. Um, there's computational biology, there's computational astronomy, computational whatever it is you want, there is a computational version of it. Uh, so one example from uh, research that I've conducted is in the area of air pollution and health. Now air pollution and health is a, is a big field and it, and it involves a kind of, is a confluence of features that make reproducibility very important in this area. Uh, the first is that we're estimating very small but very important public health effects uh, in the presence of much stronger signals. So you can think about air pollution as something that's you know, perhaps harmful, but even if it were harmful, uh, there are many other things that are, going, that are going to be more harmful that you have to worry about. And so pollution is going to be not at the very top of the list that's going to harm you. Um, the results of a lot of air pollution research inform kind of substantial policy decisions. Uh, regulations uh, will be based on scientific research in this area. And so uh, these regulations can affect a lot of stakeholders and, and furthermore can cost billions of dollars to implement. Finally, we use a lot of complex statistical methods to uh, do a lot of these studies, and so th and these statistical methods are subjected to intense scrutiny. So the combinations of an, uh, of an inherently small signal, uh, large impacts, and complex statistical methods almost require that the research that we do be reproducible. Uh, and so one of the things that we've done in, uh, here uh, at Johns Hopkins is to create what's called the Internet-Based Health and Air Pollution Surveillance System, where we make a lot of our data available, we make a lot of our uh, statistical methods in, in the form of R code available, so that they it can be examined uh, and the data and, and many of the results that we produce uh, can be reproduced by others. Um, and so the basic issue here is now is that um, you know when you read an article in the literature or research article um, at, for the most part what you get is the article and uh, you as the reader get nothing else but of course you know everyone knows behind the scenes that there was a lot that went into this article and that's what I call here the research pipeline. And you can see here that on the left side here, the author uh, is kind of going from left to right along this research pipeline. And then the, you, the reader, is kind of going from right to left. So you read the article and you want to know more about what happened. Where was the data? What was, you know, what was used here? Um, and so the basic idea is, you know, behind reproducibility is to focus on this kind of analytic data and this computational results box here. And so with reproducibility, we hope we try to allow the author and the reader to kind of meet in the middle, so to speak. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion of re re reproducible research in the in the media and, the, and in the scientific literature. The, the journal Science had a special issue on reproducibility and data rep and data replication. Um, there was a recent uh, feature in, in, on the TV show 60 Minutes looking at a, an incident at Duke University uh, where um, many results were found to be not reproducible. Uh, and this led to, the kind of, uh, to, a, to a large kind of controversial uh, series of events where studies or clinical trials had to be stopped and a lot of investigation, which is still ongoing, had to occur. Uh, finally, the Institute of Medicine, uh, in response to a lot of events that had recent that in re involving reproducibility of scientific studies, um, issued a report, kind of um, setting out best practices or things that should be done to in promote and encourage reproducibility, particularly in what's called omics-based research releases like genomics, proteomics, uh, uh, other types of areas. So, um, this is a this was a very important report. And uh, one of the, of the many recommendations that they had, um, they, in, they recommended that things, that, th stuff, things like data and metadata be made available, uh, that computer code be fully specified, um, and so that people can examine it to see what happened, um, and then all the steps of the computational analysis be uh, kind of described uh, so that people can uh, study it and reproduce it. So, 
what do we need for reproducible research? So what is the definition? And I think there's a variety of ways to talk about this, but one basic definition that we've come up with is that the analytic data be available. So the data that were used for the analysis that was presented. Um, this is different from the raw data because very often in a given analysis, the raw data are not, are not all used for an analysis, but rather some subset is used. Um, now, it may be interesting to see the raw data, but it, it may be impractical to actually have it. So the analytic data is key to examining a data analysis. Uh, the analytic code is also important. So this may be the code that looked at the, that, that was applied to the analytic data and produced uh, key results. So this may be regression modeling code. It may be other types of things. Um, documentation of that code and the data is very important, of course. And finally, uh, some standard means of distribution. So it has to be easily accessible, all this data and this code. Uh, it's important to realize that there are multiple players uh, when you talk about reproducibility. So there's different types of parties that have different types of interests. So there's, and roughly speaking, there are authors who produce research. Uh, and they want to make their research reproducible, uh, and they need tools to kind of uh, to make their lives easier to make their work reproducible. Uh, and then there's also readers who are reading research, and they want to reproduce that work, and they also need tools to kind of make their lives easier. So some of the challenges that are out there right now is that authors of research have to undergo considerable effort to make their results available on the web. So to publish data, to publish code, is not necessarily uh, a trivial task. And although there are a number of resources available now uh, that were not re available even you know, five years ago, it's still a bit of a challenge to kind of get things out there on the web. Uh, furthermore, once even if things are out there, readers have to download the data, they have to download, look at the results, they have to download the code, they have to piece things together, uh, usually by hand, and it's not always an easy task to put these things together. Um, furthermore, readers may not have the same resources that the original authors did. So if the original authors uh, use an enormous computing cluster, for example, to do their analysis, the readers may not have that same enormous computing cluster at their disposal. So it may be difficult for readers to, uh, to do exactly reproduce the same results. Um, and then so, and generally the toolbox for doing reproducible research is small, although it's definitely growing. Uh, but it's still, there are a lot of needs. So. What happens in reality is that authors just kind of throw things up on the web. Uh, there are may, there may be journal supplementary materials that are famously disorganized, uh, and there are only a few central databases where that authors can take advantage of to post their data and make their data available. Um, so if you're working in a field that has a kind of a central database that everyone uses, that's great. Uh, but if you're not, then you're kind of out of luck. Uh, furthermore, the readers just end up just kind of downloading the data, putting the code together by hand, uh, and they have to kind of piece together the software, and it can be difficult to do. So one basic idea to kind of as a tool to make a lot of this stuff easier is what's known as literate statistical programming. And this comes from the idea of literate programming uh, in computer programs. Uh, and so the idea is to think of the art, an article or a publication or a report as a stream of text and code. And so the text is kind of readable by people and the code is readable by computers. Uh, and then the, the idea is that the analysis is described in a series of text and code chunks. Uh, and each uh, kind of code chunk will do something that will load some data or computer results. And, then, and each text chunk will kind of relay something in a human readable language. And so um, there may be presentation code that kind of formats tables and figures. Uh, there's article text that explains what's going on around all this code. And the idea is that this stream of, art, of text and code is a literate statistical program or literate, literate statistical analysis. Uh, and these uh, programs can be weaved to produce human readable documents like PDFs or HTML web pages. And they can be tangled to produce machine readable documents so machine readable code. Um, and so the basic idea behind literate programming is that it, you need a documentation language uh, that's human readable and you need a programming language that's machine readable. And so one of the original systems uh, in R that was designed to do this was called S-Weave. Uh, and S-Weave uses uh, a documentation language called LaTeX uh, and a programming language obviously is R. Uh, and it was developed by Fritz Leisch, uh, who is a core member of R, uh, and is still, ma still maintained by R Core, uh, and its website is uh, listed here. Now, there are, one, there are many limitations to the original S-Weave system, uh, one of which is that it's focused primarily on LaTeX, which is not a language, a uh, documentation language that uh, many, many people are familiar with. 
Um, and so it can be difficult to learn this type of markup language if you're not already in the field. Uh, it lacks a lot of features that kind of people want, like caching and multiple plots per page and mixing programming languages. And so, um, and it's not as frequently updated um, or very actively developed. And so one of the alternatives that has come up in recent times is, is something called Knitter. Uh, and the Knitter package for R is basically kind of takes a lot of these ideas of litter programming, kind of updates them and improves upon them. And there are a lot of kind of features that are added on to the SWEAVE original kind of concept. Um, and so it's still, Knitter still uses R as its programming languages, but it allows you to mix of, uh, other programming languages in. Uh, and you can use a variety of documentation languages now. You can use LaTeX, you can also use something called Markdown, and you can use HTML. And so uh, Knitter was developed by Ihu Asia, who was, who was, while he was a graduate student at Iowa State, uh, and it's become a very popular package uh, for doing literate statistical programs. So uh, just to summarize very briefly, uh, reproducible research is, an, I think, is an important minimum standard for computationally uh, intensive types of analyses, uh, where replication is very difficult or if not impossible. Um, we still need quite a bit of infrastructure and tools to kind of create and distribute reproducible documents um, and beyond what is currently available. But that's kind of improving as the, a, a, every day. Uh, and uh, there are lots of new tools kind of coming on the scene. Uh, so uh, uh, in, the, in the next lecture, I'll talk about some of these tools. In particular, I'll talk about Knitter uh, and just to show how you can produce reproducible documents.